Um, my name is Allison, um, Allison Botello. I work here at the New Haven Public Library. Um, welcome to It's My Life from Conception to Old Age. Uh, I wanna thank Yale Science Communication for doing this wonderful program with us again. We've done it for a few years with you guys and our public really seems to love it. Um, the speakers today um, recommended some books, which I will post in the chat after you start talking. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Nick now. Great, thank you so much, Allison. Thank you so much uh, for having us. So I'm gonna go ahead and start screen sharing. Uh, hopefully everybody can see this okay. Uh, welcome, um, my name is Nick Fisk. I am a fourth year uh, PhD candidate at Yale University in Computational Biology. And I have the great pleasure of welcoming speakers from Science in the News as part of science, uh, Yale Science Communication uh, to this wonderful talk uh, entitled, It's My Life from Conception to Old Age. So before I start talking about anything in particular, I wanted to go ahead and introduce uh, tonight's speakers. So uh, first off, we have Shannon, who is in Yale's Department of uh, Biological and Biomedical Sciences. Her research focuses largely on gamete and early embryo epigenetics. And a fun fact about Shannon is that she has performed with the Dropkick Murphys. And if you're anything like me, uh, you need to be told that the Dropkick Murphys are indeed a band. Uh, and then we have uh, next up, Demir. Demir is in the Yale Department of Genetics and his research focuses largely on mRNA biology and embryonic development. And a fun fact about Demir is that he plays guitar and was formerly in the Yale Russian Chorus. Uh, so we have a little bit of a musical group going. And finally, we have Adas. Adas is also in the Yale Department of Genetics. Uh, and her, her research focuses on neurogenetics and neurodegeneration. And a fun fact about Hadas is that she has uh, served in the Israeli military previously and has a pet oxalotl. Um, so what I wanted to do ahead of our speakers today was really prime you and prepare you for the, the sorts of talks that we're gonna uh, talk about today, the sorts of topics we're gonna cover. And to do so, I think I wanted to enforce uh, something that has stuck with me as a biologist, which is even though I'm four years into a PhD program, I'm always astonished by how complex the human body is, right? So uh, here we have a bunch of different uh, organ systems. So you have the skin, uh, which kind of holds us together and, and keeps the outside out and the inside in. Uh, we have muscles, which allows us to interact with the world uh, and move about and locomote and to just, uh, you know, do things. But then we also have the skeletal system, which anchors everything together uh, and forms a uh, firm foundation for us. The nervous system, which actually lets our brain tell our body what to do. And the, the circulatory system, which helps get resources uh, where they need to go. And it's always astonishing to me, uh, no matter how long I study biology, that all of this complexity starts just from one cell. Uh, and that cell is the cell that forms when sperm and an egg combine to form something we call a zygote. And then you, from there, you simply add, to, add some time uh, as we grow up and you end up with these incredibly complex systems. And to me, that's incredible that all of these different complex systems start from just one cell. And so tonight we're gonna focus a little bit on how that happens. How does that egg, uh, how do that egg and sperm meet? Um, what happens once they do? And then how does that change throughout your life? Um, and one of the, the things that, that you'll come to, to realize is that there's this property of cells where the more that they can turn into other things, um, the more stem-like they are. And what I mean is cells are kind of like us in that when we start out young and as kids, we, go, uh, you know, we could become any number of things, right? But as we get a little bit older, we go to school or we, we take different jobs, the number of sorts of careers and paths that we're taking start to narrow down a little bit until ultimately we end up in our job. And so cells are kind of like that too, where cells have these different stages where they uh, can be anything. And then over time, they start to um, divide and, and become uh, more what we call differentiated, which means the options of what they can become become a little bit narrower and narrower until they eventually have their, their last sort of jobs. And we can think of that first uh, sperm and egg meeting, that zygote, that first fertilized egg as being like the sort of ultimate stem cell from which um, all of the other sort of diversity of your uh, body uh, comes from. And something else to note that is important for this talk and is still incredible for uh, me to think about is that all of the cells in your body, they have the same information. Right, so any, any cell in your body sort of in theory has 
the information to be whatever cell it wants to be. Uh, so what sort of determines uh, what cell is going to become what comes down to a little bit about how they use that information, right? So the information is usually stored as a molecule called DNA, which we'll hear Shannon and others talk about. And a lot of what determines what cells become is uh, what parts of the DNA uh, that cell decides to use and how much of it it decides to, uh, how, how much of the things that the DNA um, sort of encodes for decide they decide to make. Um, so we'll hear, be hearing more about that process and the flow of information from uh, before uh, life even begins all the way to old age. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to our speakers. Um, up first, we're gonna hear from Shannon, who's gonna talk about conception uh, and how we have information from paternal and maternal sources. Uh, then we're gonna hear, uh, hear from Demir, who's gonna talk about embryonic development and, and really how different parts of your body know what to become and how that happens. And then we're gonna end the evening uh, hearing from Hadas, who's gonna talk to us about, not only about how and why we study aging, but uh, how to age a little bit well. So without further ado, uh, let's uh, hand it over to Shannon. Awesome, thank you so much, Nick. Uh, can, oops, sorry, just hang on one second. Awesome. Everyone see my screen? Good. All right, hello everyone. Uh, as Nick said, my name is Shannon, uh, and today I'll be talking to you guys a little bit about uh, this idea of conception and why it's so important, and also how we get this maternal and paternal or maternal and paternal information to flow from our mom and our dad all the way down to us. And ultimately, I want to also ask ourselves, how did we get here? Uh, so to start, some people. Um, try to explain this using birds and bees, which I don't entirely get. Some people like to explain that these storks come bring babies in and that's how people get here. But when I asked my mom about this question, she gave me this one book that's called It's So Amazing, and it actually is. So this whole book is a kid's book uh, featuring, a, funnily enough, a bird and a bee, and they talk a little bit about how uh, your mother has eggs, your father makes sperm, how these two things come together in order to form us. And I was also fascinated, not only about the story of how we got here, but what kind of things that we inherit from our mom and our dad. What is so different about now and this time period that is calling particular oh. attention to Asian stories? Sorry. Uh, can I just ask that everyone mute their... I think there's, um, and I'll speak more for myself, Awesome, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so I wanted to ask us about how and why we're so interested in all these different uh, concepts about how we're able to be the people that we are and how this information flows from our mother and father's side. Um, so an overview about what I'm gonna be talking about during this talk. Uh, first, I'm gonna be talking about what kind of information do we get from our parents and how exactly does that look? Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, books, libraries, and cookies, which I promise by the end of this will make sense. And then I'm also going to talk a little bit about how we physically got here. What is this physical flow of information and how does fertilization actually happen? And so to start, let's focus on this uh, idea about what does information look like in people? And so I like to think of people like libraries. We are chock full of all of this information. Uh, and we all contain um, vast amounts of knowledge and many things that ultimately make us who we are. And so if people are like libraries, uh, quite physically, we can try and think about each of our cells, oh, sorry, each of our cells as recipe books. Uh, so this is a picture of what the inside of a cell looks like. Um, and so human beings are made of all these different cells. We have cells that are made for our skin, cells that are made for our brain, cells that are made for our heart. Uh, and these cells are ultimately differentiated, like Nick was talking about, into all these different kinds of parts by these things called stem cells. But another interesting thing about cells is that they hold all the information that we have. So in this picture of a cell, uh, this is called a nucleus, and this is where all of our information is stored. 
So all the information inside of this nucleus ultimately determines everything that becomes what we are. And we can think of each of these cells again, like a recipe book. And so if we are libraries and cells are these recipe books, then what exactly are the recipes? Well, we can think of the recipes as our chromosomes. Uh, so chromosomes are something that we get from our parents uh, and they hold all the genetic information that uh, makes us who we are. And we can think about these chromosomes or the DNA that is inside of it, almost like a recipe. And so I briefly said beforehand, but I really wanna dive into this idea that uh, we get one chromosome from each parent. This is the genetic information that is ultimately passed on to each of us, where we get one from our mom and one from our dad. And so this picture here is of a karyotype. And so this circle here is meant to represent how all this information is mixed together and it is at, can be physically stained by scientists. Uh, so you can visualize what each of these chromosomes actually look like. And so this is a picture of someone's whole genome. This is a picture of someone's, all their chromosomes. And you can pair them up and then you get a total of 23 total chromosomes, 22 that make up the different parts or that can hold the code for all the parts of the body. And then also a sex chromosome. So you can get XX or XY. And so an interesting thing about these is that we get one of them from each parent. So for example, uh, here you have one chromosome followed by another chromosome that make up the pair of chromosome one. And one could theoretically inherit one from their mother and one from their father. And so we know that this, uh, these chromosomes are important, but what are they made of? Uh, so chromosomes are made of something called DNA. And you might've heard about this in previous talks. Uh, so this DNA ultimately holds, holds all the genetic code that en entails uh, for us to make something like a recipe or something like uh, all of our different traits. So a trait is something that is expressed by DNA. Um, you can have different traits for different things. For example, there is a trait for freckles. So I have freckles and my mom also has freckles, which means that we both probably carry the same uh, gene or trait for freckles that I had inherited from my mother. And so how does all this information actually come together to form something like freckles or form something like this recipe? So if we think of DNA and chromosomes like a recipe, then the things that we make from it, or we can, our bodies can make a copy of this uh, using something like a copy of a recipe, like a copy card. Um, so our bodies take this recipe and are also able to make a copy uh, through something called RNA. And so this RNA is then translated and it forms something called uh, protein. Um, so in our analogy, we have DNA is a recipe, RNA is a copy of this recipe, and that the proteins that come from the RNA is like a cookie. It is basically a progression of trying to make these things from a recipe. And so a little bit of biology uh, that I just threw at you. Um, but I would like to move on a little bit and talk a bit about how this physical flow of information actually happens through this process called fertilization. So I previously said that chromosomes, uh, we get one from each parent, but how exactly do we get these chromosomes to begin with? I had said that you get one from your mom and one from your dad, and this comes in the form of an egg from your mother or sperm from your father. So an egg contains one copy with 23 chromosomes and the sperm contains one copy with 23 chromosomes, each from your mother and father respectively. And then these two things come together in order to form something called a zygote. And so this single cell is the one cell that is responsible that keeps on dividing and dividing and growing to ultimately form each and every one of us. And so within the zygote, as you can see, you have these pairs of chromosomes. Again, one is from the mother and one is from the father. But how exactly does the sperm meet the egg? What is this journey and why is it so important? Well, it's incredibly important because we all need these 46 chromosomes in order to develop. And so uh, 
the ultimate journey of a sperm is one of the greatest journeys that all of us have been through, but don't remember. Uh, so a little bit about uh, what exactly happens uh, on the paternal side. Uh, so, sorry, a little bit about what happens on the father side to produce these sperm. Um, so sperm are located in this thing called the testes. And they are derived from these stem cells uh, that are in the testes that uh, encode the cell for sperm. And this whole process is called spermatogenesis in order to form a sperm. And then after these sperm are formed within the testes, uh, they go to the epididymis where they gain movement. And so here I have a little video uh, from our friends at UCSF uh, where they study how sperm move. And so you can see that these sperm have different heads and then they also have a tail that moves back and forth. And this progression and this movement of the tail to project the, the sperm head forward is ultimately how this genetic information is able to flow and actually move from the father to the mother. And so this is absolutely incredible, this whole idea that this genetic information, all these chromosomes are packed inside of one tiny head and they're able to physically get from one place to another. And this ultimately is what makes us who we become. And so this whole process, I like to refer to as the great sperm race. Again, this is the greatest race of our lives that none of us remember. Uh, and so it starts down uh, in the female tract and then it goes, or sperm go through the cervix, uh, up through the uterus, and then eventually to a fallopian tube where they finish and reach the egg. And so I'd like to take a little journey on you guys with this harrowing journey about uh, how sperm move from the beginning to the finish of this great race. So at the beginning, about 250 million sperm will enter the tract. And so that's a ton of sperm, but right upon impact, uh, they, they encounter a couple of different uh, issues, which include the acidic lining of the female tract, as well as the female immune response. So like when you get a cold and your body will make cells in order to fight a invading foreign bacteria, um, the same thing also happens with the female body, in which case it will actually go in and attack the sperm because they think it's in a foreign body coming in. And so of this 250 million sperm that enter the tract, only about 2 million actually make it to the cervix, which is all the way up until like the first obstacle. And so you think that 2 million sperm, that's more than enough to fertilize an egg. But the sperm have to go through another course uh, called the cervix. So the cervix is almost like a maze. It has all these different areas and routes that sperm can travel through, and it can ultimately get lost in a couple of these crypts. So of the 2 million sperm that enter the cervix or enter this maze, only about 1 million will make it to the end. And of those 1 million, they then face the big challenge of the uterus, which can ultimately help or hurt a sperm's chance of fertilizing an egg. So at this point, sperm have this decision to make whether or not they go straight through the uterus or up each of the sides of the walls. Uh, if they choose to go up through the middle, they have the issue of getting lost inside of this void. Uh, but if they go up through the sides of those walls, uh, they tend to gather together and propel each other forward. So they ultimately have something like a speed ramp going up the side and quickly make it to the fallopian tubes. However, again, a lot of them can get lost during this process. And ultimately, they also have another decision to make as to whether or not they want to enter the left side of the uterus or the right side of the uterus, or the fallopian tube, sorry, uh, which ultimately can decide whether or not they reach one egg or another egg. And so of the 1 million sperm that enter the uterus, only about 10 will actually make it to where an egg is. And so here I have a picture or a video of uh, oocyte and what it looks like. Uh, so we have uh, this outer shell along with the oocyte itself inside. And so in this insert here, you can see that there is a tiny sperm that just wiggles its way forward, breaks through the shell, and makes it to the oocyte. 
And this is the moment of fertilization. This is where all the genetic information and all the chromosomes that your father has ultimately meets up with your mother. And from here, I really, and this is the exact moment of fertilization. And so what I really want to reiterate is that it's so amazing about how each and every one of us was able to get here. Uh, I also want to reiterate how we are like libraries and our cells are like books. And within these books, we have different recipes. Uh, so we hold different recipes that can ultimately make these things called proteins or these different traits that ultimately make us who we are. And I also want to also, uh, explain that the great sperm race is one of the most important things in our lives and that it is absolutely critical in order to make each and every one of us. And so one of the further questions that we have is that once this sperm fertilizes this egg and becomes a zygote and it divides and keeps dividing all the way up to this blastocyst stage, what happens? What happens after that? How does this cell or these groups of cells ultimately become our hands, our heads, everything else. And for that, I'm going to uh, allow Demir to take over to talk a little bit about development. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon, for wonderful talk. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Damir. And um, Today, I'm going to be telling you about how do different parts of the embryo form. So, as we learned uh, from the previous talk, that the first stage in the life is when the egg and the sperm meet each other, the process that we call the fertilization. And uh, one of the interesting processes is that the single cell turns into this beautifully complex embryo with eyes and the brain and all the uh, limbs. Um, and it's really fascinating and it's really incredible that a single cell somehow knows how to turn into a beautifully organized uh, structure, which is the embryo, before it is born. And the big questions that uh, scientists still have and trying to really uh, answer is that how does a single cell form a body and shape. And this particular question has been in our minds for a very, very long time, even like thousands of years ago. Even in the fourth century BC, the Greek philosopher Aristotle was addressing this problem of how the different parts of embryo form. Um, and he had two hypotheses. So the first hypothesis was that, that simply everything gets bigger. So what it means is that uh, the baby, when it's in the, in the womb, it's like a very small baby initially. And as the time goes by, the size of the embryo keeps expanding, increasing before it's ready to be born. So that was hypothesis number one. The second hypothesis was that um, as the, before, before the, um, the baby is born, that new structures arise progressively. So what it means is that over time, the shape and form of the living uh, creature um, changes over time before it adopts this human-like feature before it is born. So, and uh, which one is right? So he didn't, of course, know the answer, but then uh, scientists were trying to answer and trying to test different hypotheses. And even during the 17th century, uh, people still believed that the first hypothesis was true. And there was this idea that there is a tiny human being, uh, which, which they called a homunculus, uh, curled up inside of each sperm. And simply what happens is that the sperm gets delivered in the womb and where this baby will keep growing and expanding. And that was the idea people had in 17th century. However, when it was appreciated that all living creatures, including embryos, all living things, including embryos are composed of cells, this view completely has changed. So here I'm showing you a picture of the human skin cell under the microscope. And here like each cell is, has a wall and uh, which is a membrane and inside there's a nucleus where it, it has all the DNA stored. So scientists were able to observe that 
even like a small embryo compared to very um, already developed adult um, human being are composed of cells. So it didn't make sense that uh, the baby will be expanding over time before it is born. So the first hypothesis was rejected and people started to think more and more about the hypothesis number, uh, number two, which is uh, claiming that new structures arise progressively. So before I tell you what we learned uh, as a scientist about this process, I would like to ask you one question. Um, which one of these embryos you think is a human embryo? I have five options here. Number one, number two, three, four, five. Which one do you think is a human embryo? You can put your selection on the chat or you can make a note for yourself. Uh, take a couple of seconds. This is how the human embryo looks around four weeks after fertilization. Is a human embryo number two? Is a human embryo number four, five, three? What do you think? I'm going to give you some time. So it turns out that the human embryo, as many of you might have guessed, is uh, embryo number five. As a four was a mice, three was a chicken, two was fish, and one was frog. And what you can appreciate is that even though they're different creatures, at the early on during the development, they have like more or less a general um, um, body pattern, uh, which is similar to each other. Like they all have a head so with like a vertebra and the limbs developing. Um, although the speed of this development happens differently, the general body plan seems to look very similar to each other. And um, of course, for ethical reasons and uh, for convenience reasons, we cannot really study a uh, human embryo uh, to learn about how, embryo, uh, how from a single cell we get the uh, beautifully developed embryo. Uh, and when I say for convenience, uh, what I mean is that the human embryo compared to many other embryos, so for, like, for example, frogs or fish, are way, way smaller. So it's really hard to even extract, to find, and to even observe under the microscope the development of the embryos in humans. So scientists traditionally have been using uh, frogs, chicken, and uh, fish to study the, the development of the embryos and to understand the fundamentals about the development. Um, so in the next uh, set of slides, I'm going to be primarily focusing on set of experiments that scientists did using frog embryos and what they learned about the development. So because understanding the developmental process in one organism can open up many doors in understanding the development in many other organisms, which are evolutionary, evolutionary related. So the journey in the life of frog also starts when the sperm and egg meet each other. And over time, these particular cells divides many times that so results into the structure called blastula. And what it is, is simply a bag of cells, like hundreds of cells. Um, and eventually, somehow, magically, these cells find themselves, they move uh, around, and they turn into this uh, beautiful embryo with the eye and the muscles and all the like um, body plan. So the question is, how do we get from this bag of cells, this beautiful and complex embryo? So I'm gonna give you the answer right away. So it turns out what scientists have found is that even though this uh, bag of cells, see, see, it, it, even though it looks like they're all the same cells, turns out that these cells already have determined what they want to become. So certain cells on top, they already said to uh, each other that we want to be skin cells. The other cells in the back, they already decided they want to be brain cells and so on. So let's, let's uh, try to understand uh, what I mean by that. So if we were to transform this bag of cells into this small orange bubbles, what I mean is that certain cells, certain bubbles have decided that they want to be brain cells. And they're saying we're brain cells we know we want to form a brain and we're committed early on and we'll do everything to become brain cells. And there are certain other cells adjacent to them 
that said, we want to be muscle cells. We want to um, uh, move around the bones and everything. And we want to make this organism strong and uh, very agile. So um, what I told you so far is that scientists have uh, discovered that uh, this uh, bag of cells, the blastula structure, have already decided their fate in order to give rise to this beautiful embryo with a head and tail and all these structures and eyes. And it turns out because of this thing that we call like a fate map. So simply the, the structure has its own uh, compass, it's uh, its own GPS and it knows where to go. It knows uh, who's, um, uh, which neighbors it, it would like to have, which eventually will give rise to a beautiful embryo with all the structures. Um, and you might be asking yourself, how did, how did we learn all all of this like how did scientists come to this conclusion so and there were a set of interesting experiments that scientists have done to understand the development so one of the experiments that was done is a transplantation uh, experiment so what you're looking at are two embryos embryo number one on the left embryo number two on the right the embryo number one on the left is a donor embryo what we call and on the right is a recipient so what scientists did they Take the cells that have committed to becoming brain cells from a donor embryo, and they simply transplanted them into the recipient embryo. Now look at the recipient embryo. It has two regions with the cells that have committed to become a brain cell. So what do you think will happen to this recipient embryo? How do you think this recipient embryo will develop? Take a couple of seconds. You can put your answers on the on the on the chat. Or you can there's. Um, Make a, make a note for yourself. So do you think this embryo will completely die? Or do you think we'll have an embryo with two brains? Or would these cells turn back to normal cells? What do you think will happen? So it turns out that when you let the recipient embryo to develop for some time, um, we get the embryo with two heads. And this is the picture of the two-headed tad, uh, tadpole. And when you look at it, it's mind-blowing. How did we get a two-headed embryo uh, from this uh, transplanted uh, cells? So it turns out that these cells already, like early on, they have decided their fate. They have committed to their fate. And no matter where they go, like which in this case is another embryo, they will give rise to another head. So, which is fascinating. And the question is, how does the self-transplantation give rise to two heads? What is the mechanism behind it? What, what is really special about those cells? Um, so in order to uh, answer this question, uh, scientists have done many experiments and they found out that inside of the cell, as Shannon uh, alluded earlier, we have recipes, like recipe cards in the form of mRNA. And those recipe cards tell each cell how to function and uh, what, to, what to become. So it turns out that brain cells have so much of this recipe that tells them that they need to be a brain cell. So they're screaming, I want to be brain, I want to be brain. And it's all in the genetic form, which, which is like a genetic code that we have here. So in order to test uh, the hypothesis, if this uh, particular recipes are making these cells special if they are helping these cells to commit to fate. What scientists did is that they simply took a needle, they uh, put some of these uh, messages, which they have synthesized separately in the tube, and they inject it into some cells that are not committed to become brain cells to really test if they can make these cells to commit to a new fate. So now these cells um, have uh, so much of this information that tells them that need, they need to be a brain. So, and what they found is that the injection of this message in the form of mRNA, again gave rise to tadpole with two heads. And that was very fascinating. So mRNA simply determines the fate of the cell and it helps them uh, to, to give rise to another uh, nervous system. 
Um, and um, so what we learned so far is that even though we have the uh, structure with like almost no um, uh, shape, it's like simply like a bag of cells, it already has this committed to the fate of like what to become. So skin cells give rise to skin cells, um, brain cells give rise to brain structure and so on. Um, so what I want you to walk away uh, uh, today was, is that uh, the cell fate during the development is decided very, very early. Even like in, in, in the case of uh, this frog cells, they are decided in like a couple of hours. And, uh, and these uh, cells, what makes them special when they commit to a fate is that the abundance of different mRNA recipes. So for example, the brain cell has so much of the recipe to make them brain cells and muscle cells has so much recipe to make them muscle cell and so on. And it's all in a form of genetic code. Um, and in the next uh, talk, uh, Hadas, she's going to tell you all about aging, all the incredible things we learned about aging, all the incredible organisms uh, that, that, that uh, we found out age in a peculiar way and, um, and how to age actually in a healthy way. So we'll learn all about beauties of aging from Hadas. Thank you. Thanks for that great talk, Damir. Can you see my screen? All right. Hi, I'm Hadas. I'll be talking today about aging. Uh, and to talk about aging, I'll focus on three questions. Um, what is aging? Um, how we study it and what we can do about it. And uh, here I want to be clear that we are all aging all the time. It's a natural and essential process. And so uh, our objective should be to extend health span rather than lifespan. And what I mean by health span is that our goal is to extend the amount of time that we are healthy and functioning uh, and not just the time we are breathing. Um, so to start, let's define aging. What is aging? Or at least uh, what aging is to a cell. See, all our cells start from one cell that has the potential to create every other type of cell in our body, uh, like Shannon talked about. Um, and uh, then that cell divides and creates many others, um, most of which become one type of cell and remain that type of cell for the rest of our lives. Uh, like these brainy cells that Demir talked about. Um, but I want to talk about what happens to our stem cells when we're um, full-grown adults, because um, stem cells within our tissues keep us healthy and, um, uh, and replenish our cells, but something happens to those stem cells when we age. And what happens to our stem cells is called cellular senescence. Um, once we are fully developed, a, a small number of our cells remain stem cells, here represented by these orange circles, uh, meaning that they continue to divide uh, throughout our life and replenish these cells that have decided what they're going to be. Uh, for example, um, muscle cells. Um, in, in our muscles are mostly non-stem cells that make up the muscle tissue until those cells eventually uh, die and are replaced by new cells that have divided from the stem cell. So the stem cell is like this factory always creating new cells, but eventually uh, these cell factories, these stem cells stop dividing uh, and stop creating new cells. And this is called cellular senescence. So a big question is why do stem cells eventually senesce? Can't they just keep dividing? Or can we just have a few more stem cells? Uh, and all these questions are being asked by scientists and uh, currently remain unanswered. So on a cellular level, cellular senescence is aging, okay? Um, but 
what is happening to those precious stem cells that is making them senesce? Uh, so if you've read or heard a talk before about aging, you may have heard about telomeres. Um, this is a hypothesis about aging or about why stem cells eventually senesce. So each stem cell um, and every cell in our body, almost everyone, um, uh, has all of our genetic material in it. Uh, that is DNA that compresses into these chromosomes, which are uh, cookbooks in our analogy, right? Um, and telomeres are uh, these constructs that sit at the edge of our chromosomes and protect our genetic material. Um, and this is sort of like these uh, little plastic bits that protect the ends of our laces. And sort of like these plastic bits uh, uh, can wear away over time and um, our laces can unravel, with every cell division, telomeres are thought to get shorter and shorter. And eventually, um, they leave our genetic material uh, exposed to damage. So the theory is that at this point, when our genetic material is exposed to damage, there are no more telomeres protecting them, uh, cells decide to senesce so as not to divide and pass on damaged material. Um, a lot of research has gone into testing this hypothesis, um, but research show, has shown that uh, telomere length was unrelated to mouse age, and that some human telomeres did not shorten at all over their lifetime um, in humans. So um, we talked about aging, uh, at least on the cellular level. Um, and the next question I want to tackle is um, how we study aging, especially because we're not sure that telomeres have anything to do with it, right? So. For this, I want to tell you about some amazingly interesting animals that, um, that we have lots to learn from and scientists are studying today. And I want to tell you just a little bit about genetics and what we can learn about aging from genetic studies. Um, so some animals have definitely got down that slow and healthy aging much better than we do. And so the best we can do is try to learn from them. Um, does anyone have a guess? You can write it in the chat what the longest living animal known to us is. I see turtle. That's pretty good. Tortoise. Um, eagle. Interesting. Um, I, I have no idea about eagles. I know turtles are pretty high up there. Um, but no, the oldest animals known so far uh, are 15,000 year old Antarctic sponges. Um, Antarctic sponges are not the answer to the question who lives in a pineapple under the sea, and most of them do not wear pants, but um, they have pretty much cracked the code to immortality and scientists are studying how they do it. Um, you might be asking yourself what we can possibly learn from the about our glorious selves um, from these porous animals that we use to wash our dishes. Uh, and so I will also present you with the longest living vertebrate, which means it's much closer to us evolutionarily. So this is no, uh, none other than the Greenland shark, um, which lives to be about 400 years old. Um, most hypotheses about the Antarctic sponges and the Greenland sharks and their ability to live so long have to do um, with the fact that they live in very cold temperatures. So living in very cold temperatures means they have very low metabolism. Um, and uh, I'll explain this now. So metabolism is our ability to turn molecules like the ones we eat, into energy, um, which is, this energy is essential for growing and reproducing and interacting with our environment uh, and generally living. So in a way, uh, energy is uh, synonymous to life. Uh, see, the processes in our body are molecules interacting with other molecules. So when we eat, there's a molecule in our stomach responsible for cutting up that molecule we just ate, 
Um, but in the cold, that cutting molecule will cut, but it will cut very, very, very slowly. So cold equals uh, slow metabolism, or in a way, slow living, because metabolism is energy, which is life, um, which turns out could mean living longer. Um, this connection between metabolism and lifespan was noticed a long time ago uh, and posed as a, as a theory called the rate of living theory. The rate of living theory was originally formed by Max Rubner in 1908, uh, and it says that the faster an organism's metabolism, the shorter its lifespan. Uh, and this was based on his observation that large animals outlived smaller ones. So elephants uh, outlived camels, which outlived lions, which outlived dogs, and so on. Um, and this is a pretty strong theory that holds true for many, but definitely not all cases. Uh, so just like temperature, body size affects metabolism. So the bigger the animal, the slower the metabolism, the longer they live. Uh, and this brings me to our last and very cool animal, the naked mole rat. Um, this is the longest living mammal relative to its size. Uh, and that's very important. So most rodents of the same size uh, live two or three years. Uh, whereas these handsome hairless rodents live around 20 to 30 years. Uh, so it makes a lot of sense to be studying the naked mole rat because sure, we know that cold temperatures and large body size slow metabolism, which elongates life. But humans are not um, becoming much bigger anytime soon and are not adapting to life in Antarctic waters. So uh, studying an animal that is uh, close to us evolutionarily lives in a similar climate uh, and lives a long life despite its small size means it probably has some sort of some sort of some sort of sort of trick uh, discovered yet for living a long life and so they're worth studying and scientists are studying um, these animals telomeres and their stem cells and senescence uh, they're studying their metabolism their behavior and their genetics and in fact, scientists are studying all of these animals because there are many uh, questions to ask and many ways to go about answering them. So uh, while we're still on the topic of how we study aging, I wanted to give you a little bit of an idea of what geneticists like me can do in the laboratory to study aging. Um, so genetic studies, um, uh, sorry, um, genetic studies or geneticists study genes. So um, in the chromosome being a recipe book analogy, a gene is an individual recipe. Um, and when I say expression of a gene can be turned up or down, I mean that we can have that recipe actually made. So we can have the cell make uh, a lot of protein or a lot of cookies or make none at all, or sometimes we can even change up that recipe. Um, there are many genes, many recipes, uh, many of which have been associated with aging. Uh, I'm just going to talk about one as an example, but keep in mind that there are many, many, many. Um, the one gene I want to give as an example is called FOXO3. This is uh, just the name, so don't let it distract you from the point, which is that we can, um, turn the expression of genes up and down and see what happens. So that's, uh, that's a very common study we do. Uh, in the case of FOXO, when we completely shut off um, the, this gene, we get cellular senescence. Um, and this is great, right? We can just turn it all the way up and get cells to stay stem cells and uh, never senesce and we can never die, right? Um, but uh, when we do this, we uh, turn up cell division and cell proliferation, and many times what we get is a tumor. Um, and tumors are cells that divide too much and too often and result in an unwanted mass of cells, right? Um, so uh, this, this happens when you deregulate the expression of many, many genes, not just FOXO. So we want to find a way to stay in the middle here um, not drown in cookies and not go hungry, right? Uh, which brings me to 
what do we do about aging? Um, we've talked about what aging is with senescence and telomeres, and we've talked about how we study aging, looking at cool animals and using genetics. Um, and now for what we do, what we can do about aging, I really want to reiterate that aging isn't um, necessarily something bad that we should be fighting, but something uh, we should be welcoming as long as we can stay healthy. So for uh, what we can do about it, I want to share some really great research about calorie restriction and positive beliefs about aging. Um, calorie restriction does not mean anyone should starve themselves or ever be hungry, um, but restricting the amount an animal eats consistently prolongs their life. Uh, this is, there is nearly nothing um, that more solidly proves um, to help with elongating life. Um, and now that we've talked about metabolism, this really shouldn't come as a surprise, right? When we eat less, our body has less molecules to turn into energy, which means slower metabolism. And slow metabolism with respect to the rate of living theory means we are living longer, uh, slower lives, right? Um, so lastly, I want to tell you about studies by Becca Levy, a professor of epidemiology and psychology at the Yale School of Public Health. And she has found that positive beliefs about aging may increase lifespan. She has definitely dedicated her life to this research and has found some incredible connections um, between psychology and health in the context of aging. Um, and has even shown that positive age beliefs protect against dementia, um, even if you have a high-risk gene. In this case, uh, she's referring to APOE, um, which some variants of this gene can put people at very high risk of getting dementia. So when I say variants of the gene uh, within our analogy, that is, you know, there are many recipes for chocolate chip cookies, right? Um, and uh, so certain, um, certain uh, forms of this gene, if you have them, predispose you to getting um, dementia. Um, and she has found that positive beliefs about aging defy things that are we think of as very solid, like our genetics. Um, so I want you uh, leaving this talk feeling very positive about aging so that you age healthily and feel good for a very long time to come. Thanks so much, Aras. So much, Aras. Uh, so I just want to go back over uh, what we talked about today and uh, direct questions to people uh, if you have them. So first, we heard from Shannon, who talked about uh, conception, uh, the great sperm race, and how information gets from our parents to us. Then we heard from Demir, who talked about how different cells know what to become. How, how does your hand know that it was going to be a hand? How did your brain know it was going to be a brain? And how our knowledge about this has changed since as early as the fourth century? And then we heard from Hadas, who told us all about uh, the various ways we study aging, why studying aging is important, and how we should approach aging to age well. So with that, I can take questions and, and direct it to the appropriate uh, speaker if we have any. Hey guys, um, maybe I can just pitch in with a question. Uh, great talk, I uh, really enjoyed it. Um, I have three questions, but I can restrict myself to one for now and have other people jump in. But uh, Shannon, I was curious about um, how, how does, and this actually kind of combines Hadassah's talk as well, but how does aging uh, affect sperms, like, like, I mean, just throughout their development and stuff, like, how does that happen, like, if, if there's a search about that? Yeah, that's a great question, actually. Um, I always like to think of, like, I guess part of this talk, it's kind of funny that you say Hadass and me because we got at opposite ends, but everything is like a continuous cycle, right? Um, but yeah, so sperm, uh, studies have shown that sperm count has decreased with age. 
Uh, a lot of people think that that could be because uh, when our bodies get old, that our um, some organs uh, aren't able to regenerate as quickly or as uh, well as they used to. Um, it could be that the stem cells themselves are dying off, the stem cells that actually make the sperm. Um, and then another factor is that some sperm could actually die uh, once they're generated because of these different mutations that happen within their DNA. So the older you get, the more mutations your or the more divisions your cells have gone through, and therefore the more chances you have of these mutations. Uh, and so some of those mutations can be lethal for a sperm. Um, and so all that kind of combines together. Uh, to really impact the amount of sperm that a older male has and therefore could impact their chances of fertility. That being said, there have been cases of, you know, 70, 80 year old fathers. But yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Any other questions from anybody? Hadass, it looks like there's a question for you in the chat. Um, I, uh, the question is, uh, is the telomere hypothesis still being studied uh, or has research already uh, done, fully proven it invalid? Um, I don't completely know the answer. Um, I'm, I would assume that some people are still studying telomeres because there's still a very interesting um, structure within our cells that exist in every cell of ours. And um, they do seem to um, protect our genetic material and, and be a factor in um, all kinds of things, not just aging. Um, so telomeres um, may not be that uh, backward ticking clock um, for cellular senescence, but they they do have um, other functions, and I'm, I'm sure they're being studied. Yeah. Well, maybe I can jump in again. Um, I guess we have a little bit of time. Uh, this question is for you, Damir. Um, so I, I was just wondering, like we, we were talking about how similar um, development is across a variety of organisms. I was just wondering if there are um, any documented cases of early cell fate decisions varying across organisms and what that might mean for that particular organism as compared to the others. Just curious. Yeah, as I, uh, that's, a, that's a beautiful question, Helen. Uh, so as I said um, in, in my talk, uh, when we looked at different embryos, uh, the time it takes for each organism to get to that stage is very different. So as I said, for humans, it took them four weeks to reach that stage. Um, and the same is for the time it takes them to, to reach the, the stage where they have committed to a fate. Uh, so that flash the stage. And it's also very, the process is a bit different as well. And the timing and the cell division is different. So um, the cell fate is decided early on, but the speed it happens at is, uh, varies uh, between organisms. Uh, so that's what we know. Thank you. It's 801, we should probably wrap it up. Thank you guys so much. This was very interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.